Hi, this is Jamie Flinchball, host of People Solve Problems podcast, and today we have Dr. Frank Douglas with you. Uh, Frank, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Jamie. Oh, uh, it's going to be going to be great to have this conversation. So, by way of introduction, um, you have a, a, a long and storied career that's really fascinating. We don't have time to unpack all of that, but currently you're the the CEO of Safe Havens Dialogues. And that'll be clear what that does as we get into some of the conversation. And very recently, you're the author of the book, Until You Walk in My Shoes, A Reframing Methodology to Overcome Systematic Discrimination. Um, I'll say I, I, I love the book. It was fascinated. It's such a unique approach. And, and because of this, I'll, uh, uh, a little offer to our listeners, uh, for the first five people who post about this episode on LinkedIn and tag both Dr. Douglas and myself, I will buy a copy of the book for you. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get more people to listen and learn about your book and I'll get to buy a few more copies for people. Uh, that's very nice. Well, in the spirit of Until You Walk in My Shoes, I thought we'd start with this. Can you give uh, an example of of a difficult problem that, that, that you've had to solve in your past experience that might illustrate kind of where this conversation is going. Yes, I'm actually going to go uh, way back. And uh, people may be surprised with the context. But when I was the global head of research and development for Martin Merrill Dow, which at the time was a mid-sized uh, American a pharmaceutical company. It was global, American. Herx, the German giant company, bought Marin Merrill Dow and also bought Lucello Cla, which at that time was the number one um, pharmaceutical company in France. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. Bind the two with their pharmaceutical company and became actually a top, the top three, top four a global pharmaceutical company, Erxmar and Roussel. What was fascinating was that Mr. Dorman, the CEO of Erx, turned to Frank Douglas, who came from the smallest of these three companies to become the global head of R&D. Wow. Now, suddenly I am faced with, which is usual when you have a, a merger acquisition uh, of, of particularly global companies, You've got redundant pipelines, etc. So I am forced with the task of reducing the, uh, the the pipeline, downsizing, which means that some sites were going to lose the their capabilities in a real sense mm -hmm. and some issues that they had. And normally what we would do is we would go to the usual, you know, the McKinsey's of the day, the Littles, et cetera, bring them in and uh, have them do this exercise. Uh, I decided to do it differently. And what I did is I got the three heads of research of the three companies with their teams, and I put them together, and I said, Here's what we are going to do. We are going to do this whole process. But the first thing we will do is we are going to identify the criteria we need to use to determine what the pipeline should be. What's the criteria for evaluating each compound, each therapeutic area? Now, why did I do that? The reason I did it, it occurred to me that every one of these companies had excellent scientists. They were very proud of the work they had done. And they were in a situation where the guy who came from the smallest company, and an American at that, because the other two companies were European uh, companies, was the boss. And the tendency was for them to assume that this ugly American was going to tell them to do everything the American way. Naturally. Well, yes. So my thought was, if I brought them together, 
and put them in charge, basically, of evaluating their own pipelines. As long as we agreed on the criteria uh, uh, at, at the very beginning, that that would be better. So the process was they agreed on the criteria. I signed off on everything. And in fact, I accepted everything. I didn't change anything. So we agreed on it. They then individually reviewed their own pipelines and ranked their pipelines. They each selected an external who was going to be one of three individuals that we were going to bring in for a three, I think it was three or five days to review uh, the pipeline. And that was the process that we used. I did not override the 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 individuals whom they selected. I, I knew all of them, fortunately. They were all, um, well, uh, eminent uh, uh, scientists. So they were all academic scientists who were very well versed uh, in drug discovery and drug development. And we spent four or five days presenting the pipeline. At the end of the day, this team actually identified the pipeline for Herc's Marin Roussel, which then led to reduction and change of size, change of uh, therapeutic areas, etc., uh, and was implemented by them. And the reason this was important to me is that in a real sense, and getting back to the title of the book, uh, and I didn't think of it that way then, but in retrospect, what I had done is I had walked in each of their shoes and had asked myself if I were sitting in their position, as I was at one point, you know, with my team and the pipeline that we had built, and someone had come in and had just, you know, used whatever process they'd used and had made decisions about my pipeline, I could not have been happy about it. But if I'd had the opportunity with my team to identify what we thought were the best based on a criteria we agreed on, I would feel better about it, even though we all will be sad about the, the compounds that we lost, uh, and even if it was a therapeutic area that we lost, we would be sad. Nonetheless, we would have participated in, in, in the process. That's a really cool story. And, you know, I think a couple of takes, takeaways, you know, one is, you know, the, it's really hard to plan really impactful leadership in the sense of the moment allows us to to rise to that occasion. And this was a moment that probably didn't spend a lot of time thinking about until the moment was there. And now is the opportunity to, to lead successfully or not. And so what happens in those moments, we either rise to the occasion or we don't. But uh, yeah, I, I certainly, certainly take away that lesson of the benefits of early definition of criteria, right? The, the, the analysis then, or all the discussion after that is not about what people like and don't like, what they're attached to, what they're not attached to, but just what moves us closer to that criteria versus what moves us further away. And a lot less personality driven, a lot less uh, emotional driven, not not absent those things, but much more objective. And, and that actually became the the manner in which I made made decisions. And you know, uh, about a year into it, it became very clear to me that it was effective because what they saw in action was the American having his ideas, but subjecting them to the criteria we had agreed on before we started the discussion and accepting the decisions. Yes. No, I think, and, and it's, it's, it's much easier to uh, role model following a standard once you have one. And so, so it, it, it all begins with that. So that's a, that's a, a really fascinating story. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Turning to the to the book and your work a bit uh, today, so uh, rolling the clock forward again, you know, you, this the subtitle is is a uh, you know a reframing methodology. So, 
Can can you unpack that a little bit? You know, what do you what do you mean by a reframing methodology, or how do you describe that reframing methodology? Uh, may I, May I tell you a, a story? That's cool. Like, yeah. Yes. When I completed my PhD, I was actually hired by Xerox, and for three months, I could not get a good project. And uh, one day, a young white man joined the group, and by the end of his first week. He was actually assigned to what was the most exciting project we had in R and D in the Xerox at the time. Uh, I went to have yet another discussion with my boss, and uh, and somewhere in there, I said to him, "You know, Steve, think of me not as though I'm Frank. Think of me as though I'm Bob." And I was stunned uh, to see the honest expression in his face as he became very thoughtful, and he said, "You know." Pop has only been here a week, and I've put him on the artery project. Well, I was furious. I made it out of his office, down to the office of, the, of Dr. Myron Tribus, the senior vice president, to give him yet another example of my being discriminated against. Now, about two years later, I thought about that episode, and I realized I missed two things. The first was Dr. Tribus had hired three young black PhDs to join the one, the single black PhD that Xerox had in research and development at the time. And he had made a statement that he wanted to have more black PhDs in the R&D. So it probably was more important to him that Frank Douglas would do well than it was to Frank Douglas. So <laughs> I missed the second thing was I missed my desired outcome. My desired outcome was not for, you know, the senior vice president to have tough words with my manager. I wanted a good project. So had I reframed and had I said to uh, Dr. Tribus, Dr. Tribus, could you help Steve, my boss, find me a good project? I might have retired from Xerox. Let's just imagine. He was about three levels above my boss, you know, two, three levels. He would have walked in there and he would have said, just find the man a good project. It was a bit done. <laughs> well, when I was writing my memoirs about five years ago, it suddenly struck me that as a matter of fact, I had learned from that uh, incident because many times when I was faced with a difficult problem, be it discrimination, be it conflict, I actually was reframing. And... Uh, in 2020, as I sat and I looked at the George Floyd incident and saw those on the side trying to get Chauvin to take his knee off George Floyd's neck, two things struck me. One, the individual was dying and the empathetic onlookers could do nothing to help that individual. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I wondered, had someone taught George Floyd how to reframe, would he have been able to avoid getting into that situation? And that led me to establish safe haven dialogues with an intent to focus on that individual, to empower individuals to look at their situation identify the issues that they have, particularly around equity and inclusion, and to reframe. And by reframe, I mean to find, what I say, a better problem to solve. And a better problem to solve is a problem, the solution to which not only helps or solves the problem the aggrieved person has, but also brings benefit to others in the work unit. And that is what differentiates it. It is going from the grieved I to the productive we. That's, that's especially powerful with a story behind it, your own personal experience. Um, and this idea of reframing, I always like to say that our framing of a problem, and you're, of course, a, a technical scientific person, is like a vector. It's, it's both direction and magnitude. Right. And so so using your example of your own personal example of I want to be on a project, it's a much smaller magnitude than end discrimination at Xerox 
Um, and and the direction it takes is what does it do for Frank Douglas, right? And so those two things combined, the, the, the direction and the magnitude of it, changes the not just not just the what the outcome is, but also the probability of getting a positive outcome, even if it's not the ideal state outcome, it's the probability of a positive outcome. And 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 the truth of the matter is, and I, I go back to it. Uh, even though it was uh, evidence for me of my being discriminated against, my real concern was getting a good project. Right. And had I gotten a good project, I would have been in a better situation to deal with the problems of discrimination I was facing. Right. <laughs> okay. But not having had a good project, then the issues of discrimination multiplied several folds. Right. And and ultimately, of course, your career path ended up taking you to positions of leadership that allowed you to have such an impact. Um, but you have to get there, get there first. So I, I think that that, um, that idea of empowering individuals, right, in the in the in the face of uh, you know, sometimes overwhelming odds. Uh, empowering them to be able to move forward you know, begins with that reframing, and it, it may not be all that's required, but it begins there, and then and then you build up to solution sets from there, which is a lot of the approach you you sort of lay out in in your book uh, and your and your work with Safe Haven Dialogues. Um, so let me let me let me talk just about breaking down the problem because a lot of those situations. It's very easy to aggregate the problems, right? We make them very large. Uh, we make them overwhelming. Um, you know, whether it's your personal health or it's dealing with systematic racism or it's dealing with um, yeah, a, a, a massively complex uh, merger and acquisition that you, your first story told. Um, and we have these big aggregated problems that are really hard to, to see our way through. So how do you... How do you sort of practically speaking break down a problem into the 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 more focused bits that you can do something with? Uh, interestingly enough, I have concluded that in any organization, including the family, there are two four critical things. There are equity and inclusion. The leaders, the parents. They set the rules, the guidelines, the equity, and uh, the children, the co-workers, the frontline the supervisors, they set the behaviors which signal you belong, which signal you are valued, which signal you are appreciated and which bring people together to work towards the goal of that organization, be it a family, be it a company, etc. So for many of these problems, I ask a simple question of let us look at equity and let us look at inclusion. And let me make one other step backwards. What fascinated me some time ago was and the fact that every company, annual report, you know, website, will tell you the, its principles, its values, etc., and what is the culture that you'd like to have. And I call that the aspirational culture. And I'm going to take the university as an organization because I think it's the, <laughs> the easiest example to understand. So you get this, and you go to a college within the university or a department within the university, and you find that, as a matter of fact, in that particular department, those values or principles are actually experienced differently or actually practiced somewhat differently. So that's the actual culture for that department. Mm -hmm. I go to any particular individual's lab, for example, and that individual may be practicing those things differently or not practicing them at all. 
So an individual in that person's lab is now experiencing a very different culture. So you have the aspirational culture, you have the actual culture, and you have the experienced culture. So when one has a problem, one needs to understand what's the culture that person is experiencing. And look at that culture in simple terms of equity and inclusion. And you can look at equity and inclusion. And uh, I think I, I may have sent a comment to you as I was re reading your book, the, the way you uh, look at the importance of behaviors, for example, mm -hmm. to solve problems. And in a real sense, uh, you and I are basically saying the same thing with respect you know, to the rules and the behaviors. Yep. Because if you look at equity as the values, and you look at inclusion as the behaviors, it's the same type of matrix. Mm -hmm. So we look at an equity versus inclusion culture matrix. And we simply ask the, the, the question with simple, simple approaches. For equity, three simple questions. Are there evidences of privilege? Are there individuals who are privileged? It doesn't matter what they do, uh, you know, they're never they're never criticized. They always get the best opportunities. Are the processes, be they human resource processes, are they transparent? Do they appear fair? And the prospects, is there a clear relationship between performance and potential in the company? Those three things around equity. And with respect to inclusion, sometimes it's difficult to talk about inclusion, but if you talk about exclusion, people feel it when they're excluded. Right. What happened? So, so if you look at the microaggressions, you know, micro-invalidations, you know, you're denying someone the competence they have and ignoring that competence and treating them as, uh, as something less or insulting them, you know. So the micro-insults, micro-invalidations. So if you look at those simple things to describe either inclusion or equity from an individual's perspective, you can, the typical two-by-two two matrix, you, you, you can describe what is the culture they're experiencing. Now, once you have that in the larger context, you're then able to start breaking down the problem that that individual has. That, that, that's a, a really powerful framework. And, you know, I know CEOs around the world are, are looking to lean into this challenge and, and there's a lot that they can do for the aspirational culture, but to your own point, you know, it just takes one frontline manager to create a very different experience culture. Um, and so not everything can be solved at the aggregate level. Um, sometimes we need to solve it at that, at that experience level, which is where we get the equitable outcomes. So, um, so yeah, the, the book goes into all of this as your, well as your, your work with Safe Haven Dialogues. Um, I, I think that really should challenge people to think about some of these challenges a little, little differently. Um, I, again, especially around the reframing and, and rethink about how they can actually see a path forward, whether they're at the corporate level trying to change their programs or the individual level trying to reach more equitable outcomes. So um, certainly I encourage people to to buy and read the book, uh, follow Dr. Douglas. And I really thank you for coming on, on the show and sharing your, your history and your perspectives. Thank you, Sir Jamie. Thanks for listening to the People Solve Problems podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. Visit jflinch.com for more episodes and other content. And continue to join us on your podcast app, of course. We greatly appreciate your feedback through reviews and ratings. Consider expanding your understanding of problem solving with Jamie's book, People Solve Problems, The Power of Every Person, Every Day, Every Problem, available on Amazon. Until next time, keep learning, innovating, and solving problems.